Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War Episode 9, The Rise of Mussolini Part 3, Prime Minister Mussolini. This week, a big thank you goes out to Steve for their donation, and to Cody, John, and Herbie for their support on Patreon, where they now get access to special Patreon-only episodes of the podcast that are released every month, as well as ad-free versions of all of the episodes of the podcast. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. I would also like to thank everybody who has left reviews for the podcast on Apple Podcasts. The podcast landscape is a lot more varied than it used to be, but the Apple platform is still critical to podcast visibility, and so to everyone who has been able to leave a review, thank you. Last episode, we ended the episode with Mussolini becoming Prime Minister of Italy on October 31st, 1922. This was just days after the king had chosen not to enact a martial law decree, which caused the current Prime Minister to resign, and to instead to negotiate with Mussolini. At the time that he took office, Mussolini led a fascist party that did not represent a majority either within the electorate or among the political leaders, and therefore a coalition had to be created. Our episode today will begin with the creation of that coalition, then the elections that followed. These elections were theoretically free elections. There was nothing official that made them non-free elections, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We will then discuss the actions of Mussolini and other fascists in the years after 1922. It was during this period that the fascist leaders would have to turn their rhetoric into actual policy. We will discuss some of this policy before ending on a critical turning point for Italy, which was the murder of Giacomo Matteotti by fascists on June 10, 1924. This would begin a sequence of events which would eventually result in Mussolini taking greater control of the nation and creating the dictatorship. In some ways, Mussolini's rise to the office of prime minister was extraordinary. For example, he was just 39 years old and was Italy's youngest prime minister up to that point in the nation's history. And in fact, he would remain the nation's youngest prime minister until Matteo Renzi took office in 2014, and he would only beat Mussolini by 52 days. However, in some ways, his ascension was not hugely outside of the norm in the turbulent post-war years of the early 1920s. There were also many within Italian politics who were more than prepared to work with Mussolini, even if he did not come to power without a threat of violence. And this greatly eased the transition into the new government. This was partially due to the boost that many politicians like Mussolini often received upon achieving their leadership role. The fascist political pitch revolved heavily around unity, and there were many that hoped that this unity could be achieved. This was especially true of Italian nationalists, who hoped to be able to use the fascist movement and Mussolini, its leader, for their own gains. Mussolini played into this. He would often sound conservative, and speak of a conservative future when discussing events with the old ruling classes bef even before he attained office. These same people would then underestimate Mussolini, partially due to his unrefined manners and, and speech. Mussolini would lean into these um, under-evaluations of his abilities to his great profit in the early years of his government. To go along with this, the initial government that was created by Mussolini was not full of fascists. The Italian People's Party and the Liberal Party both had high-ranking ministries, although Mussolini would hold both the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to go along with his role as Prime Minister. This would be a part of the lengthy outreach by Mussolini to the Liberal Party, using the claim that the fascists and liberals were not divided in their objectives, just in how they wanted to achieve them. While the presence of other parties within the government was welcomed by many, there was a general disappointment among the nationalist parties uh, that the fascists maintained as much power as they did, especially with Mussolini holding three important positions in his own person. At the same time, they were also in full support of the total outward hostility that Mussolini displayed for all socialist activities. Adrian Littleton would say in The Seizure of Power, Fascism in Italy, 1919-1929, that, quote, Many older politicians saw the fascist measures as necessary and legitimate 
only as a means of liquidation of the post-war crisis, which had proved so resistant to treatment, end quote. In the early months, the nationalists were seen as a valuable moderate right-wing bloc that would be able to control Mussolini and the fascists. However, any of this control would begin to fall apart by the end of the year, at which point they moved into much closer cooperation with the government, and therefore Mussolini, instead of consistently making their support conditional upon compromises, just kind of had it by default. On the other side of the coin, many fascists were not entirely thrilled with Mussolini's choices, especially his outreach to the more moderate parties. Many of these individuals believed that the fascists should have occupied the entire cabinet, and in his decision to work closely with the other parties, Mussolini, while perhaps not wholly betraying the fascist revolution, was at least causing it to lose momentum at a critical moment. Initially, these feelings of ill will were small and isolated, and did not cause large problems. But they would continue to ferment over the coming years, as many radical fascists began to see Mussolini not as a leader of their movement, but instead as a roadblock to their permanent revolution. Almost immediately after taking office, Mussolini would begin considering calling new elections. The idea was that these elections would solidify the right of the fascists to lead the nation, and also to bring more fascists into the Chamber of Deputies, where their numbers were actually quite small. These elections would not occur until April 1924, and they would, at least technically, be held under voting conditions that were not that much different than previous Italian elections. Basically, the fascists eschewed an openly illegal approach during the election cycle. However, there was one massive, critical change that was made to Italian voting laws in the run-up to the election. It was named the Acerbo Law, and it would be approved by just two votes within the chamber, mostly due to several politicians and parties choosing to abstain from the vote. It was pitched as a way of preventing the political deadlock that had been so problematic in Italy during the previous years, because the law changed Italian elections so that a two-thirds majority was instantly given to the political list that gained the most votes. A list was a coalition of parties that chose to pool their votes together, and then divide them later. The Acerbo law meant that whichever list got the most votes, even if it was not a majority, would be gifted a supermajority, two-thirds, with the remaining third apportioned to the other parties. Obviously, this was catastrophic to the opposition parties, who, when met with a coherent bloc from the right-wing parties, including the nationalists, fascists, and liberals, saw that their path was almost hopeless. It may have been possible for the opposition groups to come together and mount some kind of united front of opposition, but this would have required you know, groups within the opposition with drastically different beliefs to come together, which was just not possible. Instead, some parties as divergent as the Communists and the Italian People's Party, which had held ministerial positions in 1922, began to openly discuss abstaining from the election in protest. Most political parties would not end up abstaining from the elections entirely, but just the fact that the voters knew who was going to win and what that win would mean almost certainly sapped much of the enthusiasm from the supporters of those opposition parties. This was on top of concerns about the threats of violence from the fascists against any group that too openly defied the government, especially with the expansion of fascist power out of their previously geographically limited strongholds. The results of the election were almost inevitable. The fascist-sponsored list won 66.3% of the votes. In the South, the support was incredibly strong, especially in areas where fascist support was joined by strong nationalist and liberal support, although this generally did not extend into Sicily. Such a massively lopsided election meant that the actual provisions of the Acerbo law would not actually be necessary, because the fascist list received over two-thirds of the votes anyway. There were some claims of unsavory methods used by fascists around the nation, mostly stemming from the large majority of local governmental positions held by fascists. Uh, this meant that most election officials were fascists or supported the fascists, and in many polling locations, fascist supporting militia were used to guard the polling stations. So even if the threats were not explicit or openly in violation of the law, 
Much like the Acerbo law, the actions of the fascist supporters during the election had the effect of suppressing support for the opposition. However, this should not obscure the fact that the fascist list had massive support throughout the country. There were problems with the election, sure, nobody should ever deny that, but not problems that totally invalidated such a huge majority. Eventually, the fascists and their allies would have 374 deputies out of a total of 535. After the results of the election, Mussolini was securely in control. And perhaps the most remarkable result of this control was how normal the next several years were in Italy. Instead of continuing with a radical fascist revolution, Mussolini in many ways just settled into a conservative nationalist leadership style. Or as Roger Griffin would say in The Nature of Fascism, quote, The regime in practice did nothing to undermine the privileges and prestige enjoyed by the monarchy, the nobility, the traditional landowning aristocracy, the army, industrialists, or the church. Nor did it even attempt to bridge the acute divides between the popular and high culture, or wipe out the snobbery associated with class distinctions, education, and, and wealth. End quote. The fascist regime would become far more radical in its actions during the 1930s, but in its early years, it would work closely with the traditional political elites. Even if many of its actions were not in any way radical, that did not mean that Mussolini's regime did not begin to change Italian society, though. One of these areas in which this was done was in the realm of policing, censorship, and state control. Mussolini was himself of the belief that personal liberty for most of society should be greatly reduced in the new Italy. He would say, quote, Mankind is perhaps tired of liberty, for the brave, energetic, robust youths who face the glimmering dawn of a new history, other words, exercise a much bigger fascination, namely order, hierarchy, and discipline. End quote. Mussolini would be very hands-on with the censorship policies and implementation of those policies, with mixed results, but not for lack of trying. Part of these mixed results was due to how the policies supported by Mussolini shifted so frequently based on the situation at the time. During 1923, Mussolini had spent a lot of time and effort attempting to reform the fascist party into a structure where central authority was more readily applied. One of the primary reasons that Mussolini was so important and why he was so successful in this change in the fascist party was because he never fully committed himself to a specific view of the future. This meant that he could change and alter his focus based on the situation, and he needed a fascist party that would support him in those alterations. He also would use the constant state of flux that these shifts created to keep other fascists constantly in uncertain positions. Mussolini would say in 1932, that, quote, the foundation of fascism is the state as an absolute, in comparison which all individuals or groups are relative, only to be conceived of in their relation to the state. The fascist state is itself conscious and has itself a will and a personality. It represents the imminent spirit of the nation. It is the force which alone can provide a solution to the dramatic contradictions of capitalism. It is not reactionary, but revolutionary, end quote. This new fascist state, led by Mussolini with its own will and personality, was subject to many of the same forces that change individuals, and so it would bend and, and sway based on what was happening within and around it. Those fascist leaders who would be present throughout Mussolini's reign would be forced into similar flexible positions. Their own self-interest and Mussolini's constantly shifting priorities would push the entire fascist state apparatus into wide swings in policy and action. Here is Griffin again from The Nature of Fascism. Quote, he had no definitive blueprint for the new Italy. It was precisely this which enabled him to become the leader of Italian fascism in its formative phase as a mass movement. Nevertheless, the contradictions between different currents of fascism which hampered the formulation of single-minded and effective policies were intrinsic to fascism itself as a utopian myth of national renewal, and hence liable to generate a number of rival versions of itself precisely when a crisis of the established political culture favored its rise as an alternative ideology. End quote. All of this led to a real lack of vision and singular direction within the regime, 
with different ministries and leaders pushing different ends by different means. This inefficiency did not mean that no changes were being made. One of the early items that the fascists would focus on was the continual destruction of the labor unions. The unions in the factories and the socialist leagues in the rural areas were an early point of focus for the regime due to the role that they had played in the spread of socialist power in the previous years. There were also attempts to create fascist unions, but these received very little natural support, and instead fascist activism in the factories focused mostly on reducing the power and reach of the non-fascist unions, with local political leaders often confiscating funds and preventing meetings from taking place. These actions to prevent workers from organizing handed power back to a specific set of groups within society, one of which was the upper-class business leaders. By handing more control back to the capitalist class, the fascists were going against one of their earlier promises, which was to remove the class divisions within Italian society. Instead, they were amplifying those divisions, handing more power back to the already powerful and wealthy capitalists at the expense of those who worked for them. Or, as Adrian Littleton would say in Seizure of Power, quote, Fascism can be viewed as a product of the transition from the market capitalism of the independent producer to the organized capitalism of the oligopoly. By a remarkable irony, while fascism as a political movement originally gave expression to the revolt against the emergent forces of organized capitalism, fascism as a regime furthered its development and provided it with a theoretical justification." End quote. This was one of the contributing causes, although certainly not the only reason, for a drastic reduction in the purchasing power of wages for Italian workers in 1923. The fall in purchasing power in 1923 would be the worst in Italy until the war years. Another policy supported by Mussolini which would have economic consequences was around the goal of reversing the demographic changes within Italian society. Basically, Italian birth rates, just like in many other areas of Western Europe, were declining during the decades leading up to the First World War and in its immediate aftermath. Mussolini and others were convinced that this was due to the changes in rural Italy during that time, and so a campaign was launched to encourage large families and to bolster rural Italy. Intrinsic to this push was a desire for women to assume more traditional roles within society and within their families, specifically their traditional roles as mothers. Neither of these policies would result in much of a change, and Italian birth rates would not drastically change, while in the rural areas, life remained just as challenging and punishing as ever. These types of policies, while in line with previous fascist talking points, were not really the radical change that some fascists were hoping for when the March on Rome was undertaken, and in the year following that event, there was a continual growth in tension between Mussolini on one hand and the more violent fascists on the other, especially those that had led the violent squads during the preceding years. Mussolini had been successful in ensuring that much of the party followed his more moderate policy path, but it would prove impossible to completely remove the radicals from their position within the party. The tension between these two groups would come to a head in June 1924, and it would be during that month that a squad led by Amerigo Domini would kidnap Giacomo Matteotti, a prominent critic of the regime and a socialist deputy. After kidnapping Matteotti, Domini and his associates would beat him to death, and they would then dispose of the body, which would not be found for two months. Matteotti would have been one of the leading members of the opposition within the Italian parliament, and his death, especially when the suspicion began to grow that it was a fascist group that had murdered them, caused serious problems for Mussolini. This was the act of fascist violence that would prove to be the tipping point. Even though the fascist squads had never fully stopped their reign of terror against anti-fascists. Instead, in the time between the March on Rome and the Mattioti murder, they had continued meeting any anti-fascist activity with violence, at least somewhat independently of central control. This had caused tension to build, with the Mattioti murder sending everything to another level. In some ways, Mussolini was restricted by his own previous moderate policies, for example, the Italian press was not wholly under government control and therefore would print many stories critical of the regime and linking Mussolini's government to the violence. As suspicion that the government was involved in the murder mounted, Mussolini was forced to respond, and on June 13th, 
he took the step of handing the position of Minister of the Interior over to Luigi Federzoni. Up until this point, Mussolini had held this position, but at this critical moment he handed it over to Federzoni, who was known as a moderate member of the Italian right-wing political parties, and one that strongly supported the rule of law. Many even mistakenly thought that Ferzoni would hold power over Mussolini, an assumption that would prove to be totally false. The appointment of Federzoni was strongly supported by all of the opposition parties, and it was kind of their most important reaction to the event. They did not feel that they could launch a more forceful action against the fascists, which would just have been met by further fascist violence, which they were ill-prepared to deal with. And so they hoped, really hoped, that Ferzoni and the legal pressure that he could apply to Mussolini would bring him back under control. The announcement of Federzoni taking the position as Minister of the Interior caused Mussolini serious problems, but not in the way that many within the opposition expected. Instead of causing problems for Mussolini by pushing for moderation, the Federzoni appointment instead caused problems for Mussolini from more radical fascists. After the Mattioti murder, many fascists which had been critical players in Mussolini's control of the party had been forced to resign, and some of them had even been arrested due to their connections to the event. In cities outside Rome, several leading fascists were beginning to openly plot against Mussolini, with some, like Michel Terzaghi in Milan, threatening a possible second march on Rome, and this time instead of marching in support of Mussolini, they would be marching to remove him. At the same time, pressure was mounting from the central parties and the liberals, who were pushing Mussolini to exert ever greater pressure on the fascists to bring them back under control. On September 12th, a fascist deputy, Armando Casolini, was killed by political enemies in Rome, further fanning the tension. On November 20th, a fascist Grand Council meeting was held, and Mussolini would face strong opposition to his policy of reconciliation with the other political groups, with many demanding direct action. Then on November 30th, he would address a memorandum to the party, calling for more support for his work with the rest of the government, saying, quote, It is necessary to liberate the party from all the elements who are unfitted for the new settlement for though, from those who make violence a profession. End quote. By the end of the year, opposition to Mussolini was becoming ever more open and obvious. On December 31st, there was a fascist march in Florence, which gathered together 10,000 armed squadrists who were clearly anti-Mussolini in their messaging. Then, on January 3rd, Mussolini, in a speech before the Chamber of Deputies, made his decision very clear. Instead of speaking out against the murder of Mattioti and other fascist violence, or bringing down any form of punishment upon fascists, Mussolini instead took responsibility for that violence, and for all the fascist violence of the previous years. By focusing all of the attention and legal pressure on himself, he forced the liberals and the rest of the opposition not to act against some faceless groups that few in Italy had ever heard of, but instead against Mussolini himself. And they simply did not have the political and popular support to do so. This neutralized the opposition and proved that they were powerless to stop Mussolini from doing whatever he wanted. It set an important precedent, and in the coming days, the Italian dictatorship would truly begin a dictatorship that we will discuss next episode.